Thanks very much. Um, and thank you for the invite to be here today. Um, when TJ asked me to speak, I think he realized it was Halloween because he asked me to give you some scary statistics and to scare you into action. And so that's my role today. I'm not going to provide any answers. I think it's just to highlight the situation that is being faced by producers in the global food chain. So really, I can talk about it in three um, stages. Why is globalization taking place? what's happening, and what does it mean for producers. So really, globalization, if you could look back, is not new. However, what we're seeing is really an opening up of agricultural markets for a gradual process of trade liberalization and deregulation. And this has led to increasing globalization of agricultural trade, with very much increased levels of concentration in agricultural marketplaces. And there's sort of two factors here which I'm probably going to conflate together today when I'm talking, the issue about globalization, but also this issue about concentration. I think the two are related, but of course you can get concentration in the marketplace without globalization. And also one thing I'm going to touch on also is, you know, we've got an agricultural model which is very heavily reliant on natural resources, including non-renewables. And therefore, climate change and depletion of mineral reserves will also be important factors facing uh, agriculture as we go forward. So really, in terms of globalization, I think we need to talk about the emergence of, of the BRICS, the emerging economies coming through. So if we look back at agricultural GVA in 1998, the darker the area, the higher the GVA, and we see um, Europe, clearly high GVA in agriculture, US as well. But if we move forward 10 years to 2008, we see very much the development of Brazil, the China, the India in this as well. So more players in our global markets. And what we find is a very concentrated situation. The top 20 exporting importing countries account for about 78% of global exports and 70% of global imports. And the trade patterns that we see reflect a range of factors, including historic relationships, reflection of past power relationships, colonial links, etc. But also now, very much new and evolving trade patterns emerging with the multi and regional bilateral trade agreements. You know, clearly we've been stalled on WTO for quite a while, but this hasn't stopped, obviously, a huge number of regional and bilateral trade talks going on in the uh, Pacific, but of course, very much on our minds at the moment is the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the EU Mercosur trade talks. Clearly, these are going to have major impacts on agriculture going as we move forward. And through this, as I've noticed, also the particularly noticeable is the rise in importance of a number of the BRICS country in our global markets. Just looking very quickly, we can see here the top six exporters uh, in the world. EU28 now, the largest exporter, just overtook the USA this year. Um, then we've got the USA, so the EU exports about 120 billion pounds worth of products, agri-food products. USA exports 115, but then we have Brazil and China, the BRIC countries following with 65 and 36, and then Canada and Argentina. At the same time, the EU and the USA are the largest importers of agricultural products at 102 billion and 84 billion as well. And you can see why the TTIP is so important to the two uh, trading countries. We have a lot of trade going on already, but a lot of disputes that need resolving, and hopefully the TTIP will enable that to occur. And again, perhaps just highlighting a little bit more fully some of the changes that have been going on through these trade talks and also the emergence of the BRICS. If we just take beef exports um, as an example. So here are the average beef exports in 1997-99. Again, the darker areas, the more uh, the greater the exports occurring. If we move forward 10 years, we see a dramatic change in the nature of this map. If we go back again, we see a very big decline in exports from the EU, reflecting the change in agricultural policy over that time, but a very dramatic rise in exports of, um, from Brazil. But also, it's not just uh, the amount of exports that have changed, but really a change in the relationships that have been going on. For example, looking back to 1997-99, 
about nearly 60% of US exports went to Japan, and only about 14% to Mexico, 10 to Canada. If we look at the impact of NAFTA in this, we see a dramatic change now with 34% of exports going to Mexico and 20% to Canada. So this shows the, the importance of trade and trade liberalization in changing the nature of, of what's going on. And if we look just at Brazil here, in 1997-99, on average, it exported about 305 million pounds worth of beef. 74% of that went to the EU. Ten years later, that's gone up ten times to three and a half billion pounds worth and 30% of this is going to Russia. So again, very different nature of trade as well as the amount of trade that's going on. And we can look at similar patterns of wheat trade over time. And this is an interesting uh, example, you might not be able to see it too well, but food and drink Europe, it's interesting the way that they look at trade from Europe in and out is very much in terms of these partnerships, the NAFTA, the European Free Trade Agreement, ASEAN, ACP, etc. And we can see that going, looking there. But one of the key things, I think, and this is about globalization, it's not countries that are trading anymore, it's companies. And I think that's the key issue here. So we talk a lot about exports from Brazil, we talk about a lot of exports and imports from the US, but it's not the governments that are doing this, it's companies. And the main reason for this is that state intervention in agriculture and trade has been diminishing. You know, the process of liberalization, deregulation, has effectively you removed the state trading enterprises, the monopoly boards, etc. And what's come in their place? Transnational corporations, largely. So they've become increasingly dominant in all aspects of the supply chain, from input through to retailing. So this is where the scary statistics come in. I think these figures have been quite well rehearsed, but we just go through them again. You know, four companies now account for 75 to 90 percent of the global grain trade. Ten companies are responsible for over 40 percent of the global retail market. Ten mega companies control most of the brands that we buy. Ten companies control virtually all the fertilizer supply, and six companies share 91% of the world's agrochemical market and 70% of the proprietary seeds market. That's the scale of concentration and globalization that's occurred as this process of deregulation has occurred in agriculture. And that's what we're facing in Ireland. You know, if we look simply at the scale of some of these companies, you know, Cargill here, over I think about 180 offices around the globe. They're operating in over 100 uh, countries. And interestingly, we see they've got nearly as many offices in Brazil and China as they have in the traditional base of the US. So we can see where they feel the agricultural power is. And similarly, we can look at Monsanto, slightly less places, but again, very heavily concentrated in Brazil, India, and China, as well as their traditional home. And then we can highlight some of the major companies. You know, we have Nestle here with a turnover of 120 billion. I mean, most of these companies, have, you know, quite often said they have a turnover of representative of small planets or something like that. I'm not quite sure. But they're big, big companies we're looking at here. And again, Walmart, turnover of over uh, 400 uh, billion. So huge, huge companies. And just a few slides to sort of emphasize there is a nice graphic that was uh, developed in the US which highlights you know, virtually all these little blobs were separate companies in the early 1990s. And then over a period of 10, 15, well, 12 years, basically huge consolidation in the seed industry. So now dominated by the Monsantos, the Syngentas, the DuPonts, etc. And this is a graphic I think that's been doing the round quite a lot recently, but I think it's a very powerful one. Highlights the power of the brands of what we're eating and how it's concentrated in these companies. And, but it's interesting, you know, still, if we look at transnational corporations, still the power of this is lying in North America and the EU. So in the EU 17, about 44% of transnational corporations are headquartered and 31% in America. So even though with the dominance now, you know, increasing power of Brazil and China, transnational corporations are still very much in the EU and North America. So I think the chairman mentioned the scale issue in dairy, and I think, you know, it's a nice graphic that was undertaken in the Irish Farmers Journal recently, which I sort of adapted. So we think about the scale. So we've got in dairy, Fonterra with about 22 billion milk pool. DFA, 17 billion. 
Lactal is 15 billion. And then we can work our way through uh, the others, Arla, Dean, all around about 12 billion. Friesland and Pino at 10.7 billion. Modele at 7.8 billion. Danone, DMK. And then when we come right down to it, we're down at Ireland in that corner there at 5.4 billion. But of course, Ireland isn't one company. It's made up of a range of uh, uh, processors. Glambia at 1.6, Dairy Gold at 1.6, Kerry Gold at 1, Lakeland at a half, and Arivo just about squeezed you in the corner there, but we're probably running out of space. But I think this kind of highlights the scale pat issue of where we are in relation to the global. So, pool, and I think the issue about consolidation will always come back to this. And of course, it's not just the dairy sector. If we look at the beef sector, again, is it countries or companies that dominate? JBS are, are killing 500,000 animals a week. Ireland's clearing, killing 28,000. Again, nice figures from the Farmer's Journal here, but really, again, highlights the scale of operations that we're facing. But one thing is sure, it's certainly not a static situation. Virtually every day, there's some talk of JBS taking over another company. This was the poultry firm due from uh, a, a month ago. I, oh, June, they were discussing. I don't think it actually happened, but very much looking again to expand. And again, from the Farmer's Journal, we see the huge growth of JBS through the process of mergers and acquisitions. And it's not just happening to uh, JBS. It's happening right across our food and agricultural sector. So it's not just that we're concentrated, but we're becoming increasingly concentrated over time. So really the question is this, okay, we, we kind of know those figures, but what does it actually mean for producers? What does it mean for us on, on the ground? Um, this is a completely unrelated picture, but one I quite like. This is a sheep getting scanned at a SAC um, to highlight its fact content. Um, but I just thought it's quite nice putting a sheep for a CT scanner. So, what are the challenges then, I think? Power, share of final expenditure going to producers, the issue of unfair trading practices, which come up again and again, the issue of risk, and the issue of resources. And I think these are some of the key challenges facing producers. So again, how does this, you know, so really what we're saying is all this is going on around us, what does it actually mean to the producer? And quite often we sort of see what was originally an hourglass figure, which we sort of tailored off at the bottom. And so we're seeing farmers increasingly having power exerted on them from suppliers with very few agrochemical feed equipment manufacturers selling to them, and of course very few super bar supermarket buyers buying from them. So it's this sort of squeeze which we often talk about. But clearly it's not just there, and you know, we've seen some of the consolidation is the, is the purchases of agricultural products also linking up very closely with um, the suppliers. So you see frontier agriculture in the UK, for example, where you've got the suppliers and the buyers linking up to even further reduce the option for farmers. So we're getting this power squeeze onto farmers with the concentration. As I said, concentration isn't necessarily linked to globalization, but the two do relate to each other. <coughs> and what does this mean in terms of what the producer's getting? There's an interesting um, green paper launched in the Australia last week uh, looking at competitiveness of Australian agriculture, and there's some very interesting articles there, uh, issues in there, and a strong corollary with what's going on in Ireland. Very strong support for cooperatives being promoted in uh, Australia as a, as a result. But here we look at the share of the final price, and they've got a nice graph there looking over from 1900 to 1950. So in about 1900, about 85, 86% of the final price was related to average cost of production, i.e. what the producer was costing. When we got to 1950, it was about 50-50, and by 2000, it was about 10 to 90%. Now, this is a general economic trend. It's not necessarily a result of globalization, but I think globalization is enhancing and, and speeding this up. Now, this was a general trend, and I, I've looked at it for, oh, that's great, we've got some real figures for agriculture, but I think it was just a graph someone had drawn. And so I went back to see if we could see some evidence of this. And actually, from the US, there's quite a nice graph here. So about 1940, 
1950, sorry, about 41% of the final consumer's expenditure was the farm value share. And by 2010, it was down to about 15.5% overall. But it's that pressure on the producer that we can see over time. Again, as an economist, you would argue that this is a natural progression relating to Engels' law and everything. But at the same time, it does highlight some of the challenges on farms. And again, looking at the US, you know, for every dollar spent on food now, 10.8 cents goes to farm and agribusiness. So again, the pressure is there on the producers, and it's the rest of the chain where the money is going. And we're looking here, um, again, very clear, very strong concentration in supermarkets in Ireland, where it's a global issue, it's not quite a couple of these, obviously, are Irish supermarkets. You've obviously got Tesco in here as well. But what we see is this issue of market power and its impact on the distribution of value across the chain. So we can then see the danger of anti-competitive behaviour comes more likely, not necessarily definitely, but more likely as you have fewer players in the chain. And these may include you know, classic practices as paying for access to retailers' shelf space, own label product penetration, committing purchases of one good to the sales of others. And obviously there's been quite a lot of work in the EU and in Ireland as well recently looking at the issue of unfair trading practices. Basically these can be defined as grossly deviating from good commercial conduct, they're contrary to good faith and fair dealing and are unilaterally imposed by one trading partner on another. And there's been some interesting work, as I, as I said, by, uh, within the EU on this. And so I think it's just quite interesting to look at some of this. So here's the concentration ratio of top three retailers in just some selected EU countries. So the bottom there, Italy, only about 24% of the market is dominated by the top three retailers. In Sweden, it's nearer 80%, and Denmark. And you see Ireland's high there at over 70% as well. Then we can also see, well, how much protection a smaller producer has been given in these countries against uh, unfair trading practices. And this, this work looked, identified 11 possible unfair trading practices, such things as not using written contracts, such things as terminating uh, um, terminating contracts without any warning, this sort of thing. And they identified 11 practices effectively. And we see at the top here, Italy is effectively have all 11 practices are covered by legislation to say uh, retailers are not allowed to, to do this. Um, and we see in the United Kingdom, so, so if it's green, it's general. If it's blue, it's specifically to food. And we see in the United Kingdom, there's no general legislation, but quite a lot to protect food and, and so forth. And if we just look at briefly, Italy has the most, UK, and those selected countries I was looking at, Sweden's, Netherlands, Denmark and Ireland, at the time this was done, had no legislation against unfair trading practices, although the Competition Act came in in March this year, which would have changed that to some extent. But what I find it found quite interesting from this, can get forward, sorry, is in, within this work, they were asked, do businesses feel protected by the legislation? Do they feel protected from unfair trading practices? And here we are, those that say no. Interestingly, our, Italy has the lowest concentration, the highest amount of legislation to protect it, and yet their uh, businesses, small businesses, nearly 60% of them feel unprotected. I don't know if this is the role of the mafia or something, I'm not entirely sure, but it does seem quite interesting. UK, very little protect, you know, has, has more protection, but again, has quite high concerns. And we can see in Ireland, nearly 50% of businesses do not feel protected by legislation. Interestingly, Sweden and Denmark, which have the highest concentration, much fewer of their producers are actually concerned about this. And I think this may be, looking back at it, those companies tend to be cooperative I think the supermarkets there, whether they're still true cooperatives, I'm not sure, but they have co-op in their names, so I, I'm assuming they are, and maybe that reflects something in this. The other issue I think, and one I think came very much from Mr. Hayes' talk, is this issue of vulnerability and risk. The concentration, the globalisation increases risk. So in here we have the possible risk at the individual level in the supply chain. You have production risk, price or market risk, institutional risk, human or personal risk, and financial risks. And if we look at through these, basically all these risks are lying on the producers here, okay? And if we look at processors, they have a certain number of risks, but slightly fewer, and the retailers have fewer. 
And there's a lot of work, interesting work again, done again in Europe, looking at price transmission and how shocks to the system are passed through the price. And one thing that came out of this was, if there's a shock to the system, the most vulnerable bear the brunt of that shock, and it is the producers that are bearing it. Of all the work they did, I was asking them about this, that was the one key thing throughout Europe, throughout different supply chains, it's the producers who are bearing the brunt of any shock to the system in terms of their price. And clearly, globalization, you know, we've seen it in the dairy side, open markets, increased volatility, again, this risk is bearing down on producers. So I think that's a big challenge for us. Recently, we've seen, you know, a general, not, I, was, I think it's probably a bit too early to say the demise of Tesco, but Tesco is clearly having major problems. We've got the UK supermarket share, um, you know, it's basically de decreased considerably, discounters going up. But there was an interesting article in the Farmers Weekly saying, you know, how are Tesco going to respond to this? I think one thing can be pretty sure, I don't think it's going to be great for producers when they start to respond to this challenge. They're talking about simplifying their range, they're talking about competing more directly with Aldi and Lidl, and is that less opportunity for farmers and producers to add value and get it in there, I wonder. So who will pay the price of this uh, Tesco response, I think is a big question. Also, what we find, I think, and again it comes down to retailing, supermarkets now are seen as the director chains, and the new competition might be more chain against chain rather than, you know, directly up and down the chain. So Sainsbury will have their direct processors linked to their farmers, Tesco will have their processors linked to farmers, for example, as the UK example, and so will these chains compete more than necessarily vertically up and down the chain as we're perhaps used to? Really just a few words about resource competition before, before I, I, I come to a conclusion. You know, I think another issue here, and one we talked a lot about when we did some work in the Oxford Farming Conference a couple of years ago about power in agriculture, globalization, increasing power is also about owning the resources to produce. And I think that's completely, you know, the, the resources to produce are becoming held in fewer and fewer hands. You know, we know a very few producers of potash and phosphates, for example. We've got problems, you know, with water resources, energy demands, and so there's increasing demand resource competition going on. And the issue really is, I think, if we look at world phosphate rocks, for example, 78% of the world's reserves are now sitting in, in Sahara. Very limited reserves looking forward. I mean, the number of years does vary, but really, you know, the issue is, here's a non-renewable resource, <coughs> fundamental to agricultural production, Whoever controls that resource is going to have the power going forward, and I think that's a key challenge for us as well. So globally, increased competition resources. You know, in the shorter term, you know, we can do things such as further improvements in resource use, efficiency in terms of water, fertilizer, and energy to need to sustain current levels of production. But also, as these traditional resources become more scarce, we're going to need to think about alternative practices that will need to be developed and adopted in, in agriculture, and again, key challenges for us. So, to conclude, I think it was a nice quote by Kofi Annan that I used to use in one of my lectures for the students, he's saying, arguing against globalization is like arguing against gravity. Effectively, it's happening, it's going to impact on us, it's how we respond to it is the key issue. There's a wide-ranging implications for agri-food producers. So the question is, is it possible to increase our resilience in the agricultural sector through collaboration and cooperation? And I think that's the big question for you today. And I remember this graph, um, I'll come to this. So as, a, as an individual fish, we're very small. Along comes a very big shark to, to gobble us up. We have to run off pretty fast. But then there's this usual one, you know, well, if the fishes work together, then they can chase the shark away and it's nice and woolly and collaborative. But I think we need to be worried there might be a bloody big shark out there somewhere. So we just need to care, keep our eyes open for that. Thank you. Right.